help you to perhaps wrap your heads around a, a childhood game called hide and seek. And in this game, you've got lots of kids that are trying to avoid detection by one individual who is essentially the enforcer. In the adult version of this game of hide and seek around environmental issues, however, people get hurt. So we, make, we manufacture greenhouse gas instruments and we sell them all over the world and there are many applications for that. What we're doing here in Davos today is actually measuring the carbon emissions coming off of this city during the World Economic Forum conference and then also comparing that to the emissions that were occurring leading up to the conference. So let's look at one myth which is that you can't actually see carbon emissions and what you're seeing right now in fact are the CO2 emissions moving throughout the city that you're in today. We can actually see hot spots, we can see where the emissions move, we can actually begin to pinpoint sources and sinks. So how do we do that? The first thing we've got to do is be able to understand what are the parameters, the boundary layer, which is what that dome is, because air moves in and it moves out. And then we've got to make measurements outside of the dome and inside of the dome. The emissions had actually dropped about 30% during the start of the conference. So relative to what was going on before the conference, this city is actually pumping less carbon into the air now than it was doing just a few days ago. So if, if for example, in the, in the Olympics, if the Olympics aspire to have a greener Olympics, we can help them quantify the effectiveness of their policies to that end. But let me also say that normally people, I think, are reluctant to embrace this technology out of fear. Well, look at what we're observing here at the World Economic Forum. It's a good number. It's a good surprise. It's validation, right? And anybody who's running a company knows that you have to be able to measure your progress quantitatively. Absent that, you're completely running in the dark. So let's shift now to sources, sources of pollution. This could be a refinery, it could be a chemical plant. Very complicated. Every bend, seam, weld can produce leaks. Measuring the emissions can be get very, very difficult to obtain from that. So how simple can we make that? How about just driving a car downwind on public roads, completely unbeknownst to the operators of those facilities? So what you're looking at here are, in fact, methane emissions off of an oil refinery in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now methane is also a greenhouse gas, but it's a proxy for a lot of other things like volatile organic compounds. They do not have to know that we're in their measuring. Um, you know, that's kind of an intriguing concept. Um, the city uh, has public land. We breathe public air. Anyone has the right to measure that particular air. Now that said, I really, really hope that cities will adopt technology like this, not only because it's good for our business, but because it supports their goals and ambitions. If you aspire to make claims that you are a greener city, that you're a good environmental steward, prove it, and then take the accolades that come your way. I would hope that, that, that advocacy groups, um, or, or any stakeholder for that matter, would, would learn how to exercise better programs, communication campaigns, or whatnot, based on a quantifiable number. If you know what the net carbon exchange is, you know how to trend from that number. That number at the city scale is unknown scientifically. Again, there are estimates, and those estimates are great management tools, but they're really not great accountability tools. You know, there, there's a lot of discussion at the international level about if we, if we agree to comply with some treaty, how do we know whether or not uh, the people I've uh, treated with are compliant? And so you have to have a mechanism that you can actually look at and say, we know for certain that this country's emissions are what they claim they actually are. Because self-reporting, once there's big money involved, big politics involved, big anything involved, creates a whole dynamic, a whole influence to achieve an ulterior motive. You have to have an objective means of knowing what the true result actually is. As long as you can provide very, very visual data that are comprised of the best science on Earth and scale it, I think it fundamentally changes the whole parameter to show and tell from hide and seek. Yeah, so I think the question about visibility on, on things like fracking or, or anywhere is really that, that you know, molecules are, of air are invisible. 
but molecules of oil are quite visible. So if you have an, a, a, an oil spill, for example, you can put fantastic images on the television that show birds swimming in muck and in oil. But if you have other forms of energy that are gas, they go up miles in, or kilometers into the atmosphere and you never see them again. But it's, it, it's, it's ludicrous to think that there aren't consequences to that. There are consequences to that. So if you can provide really fantastical images of those molecules that just happen to be in a gas state as opposed to a liquid or a solid state like oil or coal and provide great scientific credibility behind it, then you fundamentally change the debate. And to your point about how do, how do people that don't have power, or how, do, how do people who don't have leverage or riches change the debate? Well, you do that through things like social media. You do that through statistics and the numbers. You know, the whole Arab Spring was all about what not having it wasn't it was not about having leverage or power or riches. It was about a groundswell movement and understanding of people just demanding that something be done about it. And so, you know, if we can provide this data in, in images that people can, can can understand, then I think that changes the debate as it should.